Hi, everybody. So welcome to the first lecture that is actually going to have material that you will be tested on. This is a bit of a big picture overview of the world's fifth biggest continent. And this set of slides on geography will have some general information that will be worth returning to as we get into more detailed concepts later in the course. And you may want to reorient yourselves a bit. So this particular picture is of a map of Lake Vanda, which is actually where my first campsite was when I was doing research in the dry valleys. You saw the big lake in some of the pictures in the life in the Y Antarctica lecture, lecture 1B. And so they might seem familiar. And this is a topographic map. It's a map that uses lines and numbers to show the location as well as the steepness of features like valleys, plains, and mountains, which is extremely important to have in mind when you're in Antarctica because you want to know what the terrain is like before you go there. And a lot of the continent, especially the dry valleys and other ice-free areas are now mapped by the USGS as well as similar agencies in New Zealand, Argentina, France, and other countries. And this topographic map is one whose format we'll talk about a little more because your first lab on maps will have a few questions about using topographic maps. And so in this lecture, I will go over how to read those and what sort of information they show. So since the second half of today's lecture is a bit shorter, I have the announcements in there. So we'll go ahead and jump straight into material. And Antarctica is an extreme continent and a unique continent, which are both words that are very heavily used in marketing as well as literature. But it's really hard to not be kind of dramatic, almost overdramatic when talking about Antarctica, because it is indeed the coldest continent, both in terms of average temperatures, as well as in terms of individual temperatures. The coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth was indeed recorded in Antarctica. Something that I was very keenly aware of while I was there was the wind, both in terms of the highest wind speeds ever recorded, as well as average wind speeds. It is the windiest continent, and the wind chill was hard to ignore while I was there. And Antarctica is also really dry, which is something that people don't really realize. It's the driest continent on average, and Antarctica as a whole is a desert, a cold and windy desert. There's snow there, granted, but the snow does not actually pile up very quickly. There's very little snowfall, a form of precipitation. And the reason that glaciers build up is because the snow has time to build up undisturbed over hundreds or even thousands of years. And the Atacama Desert in Chile is considered to be the driest place on Earth, and it may be Antarctica in terms of just the overall lack of precipitation, but no continent as a whole receives less rainfall or snowfall than Antarctica. It is also on average the highest continent. And even though Mount Everest is the highest point on Earth and Asia has other features like the Tibetan Plateau and the Himalaya mountains as a whole, Asia has a lot of lowlands that when you take a continent-wide average actually reduces the average elevation of the continent. Antarctica, in contrast, is almost entirely a large glacier covering everything. And if you treat the height of the glacier as the elevation, then Antarctica as a whole is this gigantic dome-shaped dome glacier, or really kind of two separate glaciers covering the different parts of Antarctica. And that causes it to, on average, be the highest continent, because it's just so uniformly high. Not to mention, Antarctica is the least populous continent. There are at the very most a few thousand researchers as well as their support teams there on the continent at a given time. And there's no indigenous population and never has been. And nobody really makes their permanent home there. The second half of the lecture will give more of an overview of what the human presence in Antarctica is like. Whenever anyone asks me what Antarctica is like, it's hard for me to just kind of, it's, it's hard for me to just not sort of smile and be like, it was cold. But that is kind of my first reaction because it is cold like no other place on Earth really is. And it is actually true that Antarctica gets colder than the Arctic. And think about your image of the Arctic versus the Antarctic. There's not really a continent of Arctica. There's Greenland, which is a sizable island, but the Arctic is mostly covered by an ocean. And it turns out that the fact that the Arctic is covered by ocean and not by a large mass of land means that the average temperatures in the Arctic are more tolerable than in Antarctica. And Antarctica's average annual temperatures range around below 10 degrees Celsius on the coasts and then below 60 degrees Celsius in the parts of the interior that are farthest from the coast. And they have recorded 
So negative 60 degrees Celsius um, is not the lowest temperature ever recorded. The lowest temperature ever recorded was at Lake Vostok. Um, and that was a temperature of negative 89.2 degrees Celsius or about 129 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. So horrifyingly cold. And indeed, the farther you get away from the ocean, the colder it gets. Lake Vostok is quite, quite far from the ocean. So the, that is the continental effect. The farther you are from the ocean, the more extreme the temperature is. Now, Antarctica is also isolated from warm water by a feature known as the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which is a current that runs around the entire continent and blocks warm water. And then there's latitude, which refers to how far away Antarctica is from the equator. For one thing, being far from the equator means less sunlight, and less sunlight means coldness. And the Arctic is also cold because of this. And most of the differences between the Arctic and the Antarctic in terms of temperature relate to the continental effect and the circumpolar current. So why indeed is Antarctica colder than the Arctic? So heat capacity is a physical property that is inherent usually to a substance based on its chemical structure. So water is the molecule H2O and it has a particular heat capacity that is quite high. It is 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And that means that you need 4.18 joules, which is a unit of energy, to raise a single gram of water by a single degree Celsius. So heat capacity relates to how difficult it is to heat something up or to remove, remove or it's to, to change the temperature. Heat capacity refers to how difficult it is to raise or lower the temperature of something, basically. So 4.18 doesn't sound huge, but for comparison, the published estimate for the heat capacity of the rock granite, which is Granite and similar rocks make up most of the continents, in fact. The heat capacity for granite is 0.79 joules per degree Celsius per gram. So that means that it's much easier to heat down or to raise the temperature of rock than it is water. Antarctica as a continent is made of rock. It's made of granite and similar rocks. The Arctic, in contrast, is mostly water. So what, me what this means is that the ocean in the Arctic doesn't change temperature all that much, and that keeps the surrounding air from becoming too cold, and it also keeps Greenland and some of the surrounding islands a little more habitable. That's one reason why you have much more of an indigenous population in the Arctic, although that's also related to the fact that there's just more land around the Arctic. You have the Sami, you have the various Inuit cultures, um, and the people living in the people living in Siberia. I think the Sami are more in Finland, actually, my mistake there. Um, Antarctica is just far from any inhabited land in general, which is something we'll come back to. Now, in Antarctica, the temperatures are milder near the coasts because of the moderating effects of the Southern Ocean. But as you head inland and you are far from the ocean, you are in an area where the temperature can drop, drop, drop without warning. And in this picture, you can see that the darker colors represent colder water. And you can see that there's just a very thick band of dark coal, of dark darkness that represents cold water around Antarctica. And the fact that Antarctica is so far from other continents means that you have the ability for ocean currents and winds to just circle around the continent, which makes it very stormy and very dangerous even today for people to enter the Southern Ocean and also contributes to keeping the keeping Antarctica cold. So the ocean has a moderating effect, but the, the, the Southern Ocean also ends up being cold because the current that runs through here, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, cuts off the supply of warm water. So basically there's a lot of reasons why Antarctica is colder than the Arctic. Um, and in fact, the current is extremely important because when it opened up, several tens of millions of years ago, that is when Antarctica began to turn into an inhospitable and borderline uninhabitable place, which is something we'll talk about during the Earth history part of this course. I wanted to mention that the continental effect is something you see in the US. The coasts tend to be relatively mild, and that isn't always simply the continental effect. On the East Coast, you have the Gulf Stream, which brings warm water and keeps the Atlantic Ocean significantly warmer than the Pacific Ocean. The coldest places in the continental US are going to be far from the oceans in general. I really like Minnesota, but Minnesota is cold. You only have a little bit of it that's close to that's close to the lake, and you can actually see that um, it's slightly warmer close to Lake Superior. And then you also have the Dakotas that are just the sort of the cold, the coldest part of the continental US, really, in the winter. Now, the Great Lakes actually play a role in making the upper Midwest a little more habitable. Um, you can see that Michigan, which is surrounded by water, is a bit warmer than some of the other surrounding states. And this is just one 
weather snapshot. This is just showing high temperatures, by the way. So temperatures can get lower than this. Um, but in general, if you are far from an ocean and ocean currents, that means you have colder winters and also hotter summers. In places that have, in places that have, are closer to the equator and have more seasons, you get really hot summers and cold winters. Antarctica generally just goes between being barely tolerably, tolerably cold and just miserably wintry cold. And the US um, does, you do see like the, the East Coast does have cold winters, but the numbers are significantly higher, indicating you have higher highs because the ocean and the Gulf, the presence of the ocean as well as the Gulf Stream keep the East Coast a little warmer. Um, so this kind of gives a good big picture sense as to the continental effect. On a smaller scale, if you're from California, the coasts of California tend to not have much in the way of temperature variations. We don't, they joke, people, we joke that we don't really have seasons in Santa Barbara. Um, it's a little warmer in the summer and a little cooler in the winter, but not noticeably so. But then you get to the deserts and the Central Valley and the, the deserts in the Central Valley get miserably hot in the summer. Um, and that's because the temperature fluctuates more because you're farther from the ocean. Now, latitude is a term we'll go over. It is a number that indicates the geographic distance from the equator. So a high latitude or a large number is um, tells you that you are farther away from the equator. Look at the numbers on the left in this diagram. Those show latitudes. These just show the, light, the angles that sunlight is hitting these different latitudes. Now, this diagram explains why it's cold in a place like the Arctic during the Arctic summer, even though due to the tilt of the Earth's axis during the Arctic summer, the Arctic is in complete light. So we'll return to the, to the Earth's axis when we talk about climate more. But Earth's axis is tilted and that causes the area of, that causes the Arctic to be in almost complete sunlight for part of the year. And at that same time, the Arctic is, the Antarctic, excuse me, is in near complete darkness. Now, again, it's still pretty cold in the Arctic during the summer. And that's because the sunlight, as you see, is kind of just glancing across the surface. At the equator, the beams of sunlight, which carry the energy from the sun, are hitting the Earth head on. But at the pole, they're glancing off it. And what this means is that the polar sun, what this means is that the sunlight doesn't very effectively heat the air there. And it's still cold, even though it's shining all the time. And really, people refer to the polar sun as if it's kind of a different star. It doesn't heat the air as efficiently, so it's colder. And the, the light also looks kind of like it's filtered. And this actually contributes a lot to Earth's overall climate and circulation patterns. And this causes both the Arctic and the Antarctic to become to become colder. And it also contributes to them being to to one of them being in complete darkness for part of the year. And the Solar radiation is something we'll talk more about its role next week. Now, another reason Antarctica is so cold is the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. It is so isolated from the other continents that there is a current that has developed around the entire continent. And that is the only current that makes a complete loop around a continent. It flows west to east, and it flows very fast compared to most surface currents. It flows at a rate of 100 to 150 sphere drops, which is a unit that refers to the volume of water being moved every second. And it actually plays a very important role in helping water circulate and mixing water in the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean, and contributing to the and it's it's a big reason why we consider the oceans to all be linked now, because the Antarctic Circumpolar Current and the Southern Ocean connect all three oceans. But it also provides a bit of a barrier. Going from north of the Circumpolar Current to south of the Circumpolar Current is very difficult. Masses of water don't mix very well. And so warm water heading from the equator gets blocked by the Circumpolar Current. There is no equivalent current in the Arctic. There is no Arctic Circumpolar Current. And that means it's easier for warm water to flow into the Arctic. And again, you want to remember that warm water brings balmy temperatures. The east coast of the US is more habitable, more warm and habitable than it would otherwise be because there is a warm surface current coming there from the equator. And again, a lot of people just don't really realize how, oops, don't realize how dry Antarctica is, at least until they've been there. 
And my skin can attest to that. Um, I felt, even when it wasn't windy, being in Antarctica felt like growing up in Arizona. You just feel the, the dry air evaporating all of the water out of your body. And the ice doesn't get there because it snows a lot. The ice gets there because the snow accumulates very slowly and almost undisturbed for thousands or even millions of years. Antarctica is in one of the world's desert belts, and those are latitude at which the air that is arriving has almost no moisture. The average place in Antarctica gets less than two inches of snow in an entire year. And if you compare that, so if you compare that to the map of Santa Barbara precipitation on the left, we have some, we've had some years where annual rainfall um, has been as high as 45 inches. Um, Santa Barbara is generally a very dry area, but you still have even during dry years, you have say 12 inches of rain, and then you have some wet years to counterbalance those out. So Antarctica is, Antarctica doesn't really have much in the way of wet years. It's a very, very dry continent. The most precipitation occurs at the peninsula, which is a bit farther away from the dry zone. The dry zone is right around the pole. And the dry zone is right around, is right around the pole itself. If you get a little farther away, you get a little more moisture right around the coasts and on the peninsula. And in general, the peninsula is going to be a bit of an anomaly or a bit, a bit different compared to the rest of the continent because it's a bit farther north, which in general makes it a bit warmer and a bit more habitable than the rest of the continent. And likewise, it's also, the peninsula is also the part of the continent most being affected by global warming. Now, I wanna mention that um, Antarctica is the driest continent, but not the driest place on earth necessarily. People refer to the Atacama Desert in Chile as the driest place on earth because in some years it receives no rain. But Antarctica is a much drier continent than South America on average. The continent of South America has the Atacama Desert. It also has the Amazon rainforest. Antarctica doesn't really have a lot of wet areas that really counterbalance it out. The whole continent is more or less one giant big desert. And Antarctica is considered to be the windiest continent, largely because of the average wind speeds and the near constant winds. And a lot of this has to do with something called catabatic winds, which are these pressure winds coming from the pole and heading towards the coast that we will learn more about next week. The air is falling in a high pressure zone at the pole and it heads out towards the coasts down from the higher up interior to the lower down coasts. And you basically have constant wind blowing from the interior. And if you're in a valley, you can get a wind tunnel effect. This is actually why the dry valleys are dry. The wind, which is already intense, gets channeled into these valleys and becomes even more intense and blows the snow away before it can accumulate. Now, the Southern Ocean is also considered to be the world's stormiest ocean because winds can blow basically uninterrupted in a circle around the continent. Most of the people who ventured anywhere near the Southern Ocean early on in the history of Antarctica wisely decided not to go any farther, but obviously enough people made it through that we eventually figured out what was down there, that there was a very fascinating but very dangerous continent there. I can attest that this is miserable, by the way, sitting up tents during windy conditions. I didn't have to deal with snow blowing in my face because I was in the dry valleys, but it was still pretty miserable especially when it's like, oh, this is my only shelter and I can't even get it up because of the wind. Yeah, I survived it obviously, but it's like, ah. Anyhow, Antarctica is the highest continent. Now it doesn't have the highest place on earth. That is Mount Everest, which is in Asia. However, Asia is not the highest continent on average because you have lowlands like the Ganges Delta or coastal areas of China or low-lying islands, as well as the Dead Sea, since um, the Middle East is considered part of Asia for, for these purposes. Um, and Antarctica's highest point is nowhere near as high as Everest. It's um, about a little bit more than half as high as Mount Everest. It's Vincent Massif, which is a mountain in the interior. But if you look at this map, you get the sense that Antarctica is kind of just this big dome. There's a little bit of vertical exaggeration in this, in this diagram, but the glacier kind of covers everything and evens everything out. And the glaciers are so thick that that means that Antarctica as an average has a high elevation. And the, the interesting thing is that even if you, even considering that the glaciers are actually heavy enough that they are physically pushing the continent down into Earth's mantle, which is a concept I'll return to later, it is still 
on average, the highest continent. And there's a feature, excuse me, there is a word for the people who study elevation and features like mountains and glaciers and valleys, and that is topography. And topographers, or people who study topography, study landforms and use lines and numbers to construct maps of those features. Those maps are then used to help geologists like me plan their field research, or in places that are a little more close to home, they also use topography to plan the locations of cities, make decisions about neighborhood planning, decide whether it's viable to build a structure somewhere, etc. And we will actually get to the question of what does Antarctica look like under the ice and what would happen if you took all the ice away. Um, a lot of that would depend on what, on how quickly it would happen. If all the ice were taken away at once, that would kind of cause Antarctica to be mostly below sea level actually. So let's talk about topographic maps. Topographic maps exist to help visualize mountains and valleys and other features on a two-dimensional surface. Oops. Apologies for that. And they take practice to look at. The first lab will guide you through them. You'll notice that a topographic map is often going to be placed over another map so that you will have lines with numbers overlaid with place names, the locations of lakes and the like. Or in a geology context, you can also put, say, the locations of rock units you're interested in superposed. And topographic maps are an advanced version of connect the dots, essentially. Each of these lines is all of the dots that have been determined to be the same elevation connected. You end up in, in the simple case with this mountain peak, you end up with a number of concentric circles, vague, cir vague circles, because going up the mountain, you have a line of points that is all the same elevation. And when making a topographic map, you decide first on the interval. The contour interval is the difference in elevation between one line and the next. And this is really important because it allows us to read the map and to understand factors like how quickly the elevation is changing, AKA how steep it is. So that's why, that's why you have these contour lines being different amounts of space apart. You know that the difference between this outer line and this, this line next to it must be 200 feet, AKA that if you go from this point to this point, you are gaining um, say, oh, excuse me, it's actually 100 feet in this example. You're gaining 100 feet of elevation. And then as you go from this line to the next one, you're also gaining 100 feet in elevation. If two lines are closely spaced apart, like in the center of, if two lines are very close together, like in the center of the mountain, that means it's steep. You aren't having to cover a lot of horizontal distance to cover a certain amount of vertical distance. But if they're more spread apart, that means you do have to go a long way to, to climb. Think about how, say, think about like the Great Plains of the US, how they slope gently upward towards the Rockies and you're gaining elevation, but you're doing it while driving hundreds of miles across the interstate in Kansas or Nebraska and wondering just how, just wondering how much you're going up because you can't really see it. But then if you actually, when you actually get to the Rocky Mountains, a topographic map of the Rocky Mountains would be much more, would have lines that were much more spaced together because then you can actually, you're actually climbing without covering as much horizontal distance. And in Antarctica, this is important. Um, in Antarctica, this tells us how, if we're doing field research out there, how steep the mountains we have to climb are, um, which was, so it's hard to see the lines on this map, but you can see that they're more, if you look closely, you can see that they're more spaced apart, more widely spaced apart by the lake because that's the floor of the right valley. And if you go up either side, as you get up into the mountains, they get scrunched up more together. And some samples we were looking for were actually up in the mountains and we had to look at the topographic maps to make a decision as to how much time we needed to set aside to climb, to climb those steep mountains. And one thing you need to realize when you work on the lab is that you need to specify units, um, whether it's feet or meters. And topographic maps are they take getting used to, but once you learn what information you need to look for the contour interval, what units you're dealing with, and you learn that contour lines don't ever cross because again, each, each one is made of points of all the same elevation, it becomes a bit more intuitive. But the TAs will be here next week, will be at their sections next week to help you with that. So topographic maps are a type of map that tell us about elevation, oh, that tell us about elevation. And we usually superimpose those other, other, other maps so that you can make predictions about slope and distance um, and 
figure out how many miles away something is from something else. Making maps is not all that simple, unfortunately, mostly because turning a globe into a flat surface isn't that easy to do. Maps are not perfect. They are based on models called projections that systematically convert points on a globe, as well as their distances from one another, into intelligible images on a two-dimensional surface. Now, if you think about it, the poles are kind of scrunched up in a sense because they're at the point at the top. And indeed, the lines of longitude, which are the lines that tell you how far east or west you are, converge at the poles. And map distortion is the stretching that you see on maps caused by this. And most projections are unfortunately centered at the equator, meaning that you get a lot of distortion at the poles, like in the Mercator project projection, which I personally dislike and find to be a very frustrating projection, but it's one of the more common ones. And this is the one that makes Greenland look about four times as big as India, even though they're actually similar in size and India is bigger. And the Mercator projection really distorts everything near the poles. You'll also notice that it makes the land in the northern hemisphere look a lot bigger than it actually is because there is more land in the northern hemisphere close to the pole and it gets stretched out vertically. Um, it's again, Antarctica is quite a long way from any land. So before we talk about how we fix this with the poles, let's introduce, let's introduce some geographic terms. And some of these will be important to consider for the lab next week. Humans sort of arbitrarily demarcate regions of the world. We use something called a hemisphere, which literally means half a sphere. And so the equator is as far as you can get from either pole without going to the other pole. It's about, it's halfway between the two poles. And it is the reference point for latitude. Everything north of the equator is in the northern hemisphere and has latitude markings that are listed as say 60 or 70 degrees north. And everything south of the equator um, including Antarctica is in the Southern Hemisphere and consists of latitudes marked, marked as 60 or 70 degrees south. You also may hear the Eastern and Western Hemispheres and we sort of do and don't have four hemispheres. We sometimes refer to the Eastern and Western Hemispheres because with these vertical lines, the lines of longitude, which tell you how far East or West something is, there is a reference point we've chosen called the prime meridian that serves as the zero point. And so there is the Eastern hemisphere is everything east of the prime meridian and everything west of the prime meridian is the Western hemisphere. Or more generally, the Americas are referred to as the Western hemisphere and Africa, Eurasia, Australia, and the Pacific Islands are the Eastern hemisphere. But um, you don't ever wanna to refer to the Northern hemisphere and the Eastern hemisphere or the Western hemisphere and the Southern hemisphere. That doesn't really make any sense. You either work with the North and South or with the East and West. Don't get those confused. Oh, actually, something I did want to mention is that with the southern and northern hemispheres, you want to be careful with the fact that some properties are distinctly different in the southern hemisphere. For one thing, seasons are reversed. Because of Earth's tilt, you have the sunlight hitting the northern hemisphere more directly during part of the year. The southern hemisphere is tilted away from that, and so it's winter in the southern hemisphere when it's when it's summer here, and it's it's winter in the southern hemisphere when it's summer here. I, I said that, but you get the idea. That's why in Antarctica, I was there in December because December is actually summer there, whereas June and July and August are the most miserable winter months. Also, when we get to the Coriolis effect, which is a force that affects the movement of water masses and wind, that effect causes masses to be deflected relative to their original directions. And the direction of deflection is different in the northern and southern hemispheres. So latitude and longitude are numbers. They tell, you, they tell you either how far north or south you are relative to the equator in the case of latitude, or how east or west you are relative to the prime meridian. And latitude is pretty easy to deal with. Zero is the equator, 90 degrees north is the North Pole, and 90 degrees south is the South Pole. And all lines of latitude are equally spaced apart, which makes them relatively easy to deal with when making maps. Longitude is trickier. We had to pick an arbitrary point of reference for longitude because there isn't really a west or east pole. Zero is the line that runs from the North Pole through London or Greenwich, which was chosen because of the Eurocentric focus, frankly. And it runs from the North Pole through London down to the South Pole. And so all lines of longitude actually run through both the North and South Poles, which is a good thing to remember. So um, 
the lines of longitude actually all converge at the poles and that causes the distance between them to become smaller as you approach the poles which has been a problem for map, map making for, for centuries. And this is why flat projections like the Mercator projection don't work very well because they're based at the equator. And they kind of assume, they kind of treat the poles, the polar areas as if the lines of longitude are the same distance difference up there. And that's just not really, that's just not really true. So you have to, so they kind of have to fit artificially spread them out and it makes a mess of everything. Um, and the line of longitude also actually kind of runs all the way around the Earth. And so zero is the prime meridian and runs through Greenwich. And then um, 180 degrees is kind of the other side of it on the other side of the Earth. And it roughly corresponds to the international date line. One thing that I think is kind of fun is that the state of Alaska is actually technically both the easternmost and westernmost state in the United States because the Aleutian Islands, the islands on the west, the islands um, coming off Alaska actually cross 180 degrees and they're technically at the extreme eastern end of the eastern hemisphere. They're very close to Russia actually, um, hence some jokes by certain presidential and vice presidential candidates. And you need both latitude and longitude to meaningfully give you a location. You list latitude first and longitude second. And for you have to specify either you have to specify either north or south or east or west. Um, because notice that you have degrees east or west, there's there's one zero, one 180, but then you have degrees going from zero to 180 in the western hemisphere, and then you have degrees going from zero to 180 in the eastern hemisphere as well. And to subdivide degrees, we use a system called, um, we use either decimals or a system called minutes, which in fact is very similar to the clock system. Just as an hour consists of 60 minutes, a degree is also divided into 60 minutes, marked with an apostrophe symbol, and minutes can actually further be divided into seconds. So one degree has 60 minutes, and each minute in a degree has 60 seconds. And seconds are marked with quotation marks. Um, and that is, this is a very good slide to come back to for when you do the first lab. And here's this is this this gives you a sense of the fact that the lines don't really operate the same way. You, small circles are when you have a sphere. A small circle is a term for a circle that doesn't go through the center of the sphere. And the lines of latitude are geometric small circles that don't go that don't all intersect through the center of the sphere. Lines of longitude form great circles which all pass through the center of the sphere, kind of like the way an orange is sliced. Um, whereas kind of kind of like the way the, the slice the the slices on an orange are oriented. And so to make maps of Antarctica to get around the problems I've been talking about map makers and scientists simply use a projection that's based at the South Pole and not at the equator. And this gives a reverse situation Antarctica looks fine but the lands closer to the equator get a little bit more distorted. But the thing is for it's not really it's not really as bad as in the Mercator projection because we can't see the equator itself here and the equator is where it's most distorted. And also for a map like this, we don't really care about what's happening at the equator. Often you will see a map that has an equatorial projection for most of the world. And then they will have a little inset that has a polar projection of Antarctica as well as one of the Arctic Ocean. Um, and different models exist. I had to play around with different polar projections when I was using GIS apps to make figures for my thesis. Now, with better map making, we've been able to make determinations about how big Antarctica actually is. It's the fifth largest continent. Um, it's larger than Europe. Um, if you treat Europe as a separate continent and not as part of Eurasia. Um, either way, Eurasia and Asia are both bigger than Antarctica. And Antarctica is larger than Australia as well. Um, it is larger than the entire United States, even if you include Alaska. So it is basically a continent the size of the United States with no forests, no grasslands, no wildlife for the most part, and no people either. It is a vast empty world and it is a world of ice. Millions of square kilometers of ice are present on the continent at any given time. The ice sheets are remarkably old and stable. They have been there covering the continent for at least 25 million years. And it's believed that they started forming earlier than that, around when the circumpolar current first formed in fact. By the way, MA means mega annum or millions of years in Latin, and that's an abbreviation you'll see a lot, especially when we do Earth history. Now, 
if we take the ice away and depict our best guess as to what is underneath, a lot of Antarctica is actually below sea level. And that's because the glaciers are pushing the ground down physically enough that it is below sea level. So taking the glaciers away all at once, that would actually make Antarctica on average the lowest continent because you would have a lot of the continent that would simply flood. Um, and so the left map shows what you would get with an ice-free Antarctica. It shows that you would get kind of a cluster of islands. This would not last long, however. It would actually rise out of the water over geologic time because as the, as the weight, because basically the, not to anthropomorphize the ground too much, but the continent would realize there wasn't any ice over it and it would start to undergo isostatic rebound. It would start to rise out of the mantle. And if that seems like a strange concept, I will go over the fact that the Earth's tectonic plates are floating on the mantle. They're floating on a part of Earth's mantle. And different parts, depending on how thick the crust is or how much is weighing it down, sink more into the mantle than others. And most of what we know about the under ice topography comes from satellites. Lasers can penetrate the ice and take readings, which is similar to sonar in principle. They can take a reading of how long it takes for the signal to come back. And with hundreds of thousands of data points, they can get a sense of how the elevation of the underlying ground changes as you move across the continent. Lasers, satellite and laser technology have improved significantly over the years, and it's become possible to make much better resolution images of the under ice topography now. A supercomputer actually compiles the data points from the lasers into a recognizable image. It's helped us also detect the fact that there is a network of rivers and lakes under the ice, something we'll talk about more during the glaciers unit. Oops. And this gives you some sense of what they've found under the ice, what they've, what they've found under the ice. Um, lasers based on satellites have helped us see a lot that we would not be able to see ourselves. Now, Antarctica is divided into two regions, West Antarctica and East Antarctica. West Antarctica is the smaller part or kind of the bulb containing the peninsula and this little bit west of the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, or yes, that is, that is still west. Um, and you can remember that if you go straight south from South America, which is in the Western Hemisphere, you end up in West Antarctica. Meanwhile, East Antarctica is a massive, is much more massive. It is a geologic craton, AKA a piece of crust that has been together for hundreds of millions of years. And it is by far the larger portion. Remember that I was based in New Zealand. So New Zealand is off the map in this direction. New Zealand is an island continent, is it, excuse me, an island country in the Eastern hemisphere. And heading due south it took me to East Antarctica, specifically to a part called Victoria Land. And I'm not really going to go very much into, um, I'm not going to go very much into the, the names of the different subregions of Antarctica because a lot of them are a lot of them are kind of just put there to give something a name, but there are there are individual regions within East and West Antarctica. Um, Victoria Land, Queen Maud Land, etc. I just don't go over many of them in detail because it kind of just turns into a list. Notice where the South Pole is. The South Pole is actually not that far from the ocean. It's right around the boundary of East and West Antarctica. And East and West Antarctica are also separated by a feature known as the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. Something that can cause confusion is that Antarctica has more than one pole in a sense. The geographic South Pole is what we think of when we say the South Pole, usually. And it's the southernmost point on Earth where you are 90 degrees south and where all the lines of longitude converge. However, um, it is not, there is also something known as the South Magnetic Pole. And we will talk more about Earth's magnetic field, but Earth is one giant magnet essentially with the magnetism caused by movement of iron in the molten part of Earth's core. And it's a weak field, but it actually is what keeps solar wind from reaching Earth's surface and killing us and all other life. Um, Mars is partially, one, one, one theory as to why Mars is, cannot support life and why its atmosphere is so thin is because it doesn't have much of a magnetic field anymore. Its core has become solid. Now, um, the magnetic pole actually changes. Um, you can actually see on this map that the South Geographic pole in 2008 was out in the ocean, whereas in um, 1954, it was on land. And it um, actually varies a significant amount. And it's also not that close to the South Geographic pole. So when you make maps, you have to usually designate when the South magnetic pole was, was recorded because it might not be there in 50 years. 
there's also something known as the point of inaccessibility. And that is the point that is farthest from any ocean. That is not the same as the South Pole, South Geographic Pole either. The South Geographic Pole is actually quite close to the ocean. Now, Antarctica is covered with ice sheets, which are large glaciers. And we'll go over the definition again, but the ice sheets are the large glaciers themselves, whereas you also have ice shelves extending over the ocean. The ice shelves are actually the flow of the glaciers extending over the ocean. And then you have sea ice that just forms periodically out in the ocean. And the ice sheets are used to define the division between West Antarctica and East Antarctica to a big extent, because you have two separate sheets, the West and East Antarctic ice sheets. And they behave rather differently. The West Antarctic ice sheet is less stable. The ice actually all flows because glaciers flow. Glaciers essentially are slow moving solid rivers of ice. And in the West Antarctic ice sheet, they converge together and flow out towards the ocean out here in the Bellingshausen Sea. Um, and in contrast, in the East Antarctic ice sheet, which is the bigger ice sheet, you have ice accumulating at the center here and then flowing out in all directions towards the various oceans, towards the various seas of East Antarctica. It is much larger and much more stable. It's actually being less affected by global warming right now, which is something that we'll return to. Um, but one thing that's cool to check out is that you can, if we do a cross section of Antarctica's ice sheet, you can see that East Antarctica's ice sheet is much thicker and bigger. Um, and a lot of that actually is because East Antarctica is on average farther from the ocean. It's colder and so the, the ice accumulates more and melts less in East Antarctica compared to West Antarctica. Very little of Antarctica is not covered by ice. Um, in fact, the only places that are reasonably ice free are mostly along the coasts where you have mountains poking through or you have volcanic activity or other geothermal activity bringing heat that causes the ice to melt or where the wind is strong enough. And in this picture, you can actually see two examples. You can see some nunataks, which are these little isolated hills. Um, the, the term nunatak is, an, is borrowed from an Inuit language and it's useful to refer to Antarctic geology, um, but it's used for little hills that stick out from the ice. And then you have Mount Erebus. This is not the best picture ever. Um, it was kind of hard to get a clear picture of it. But if you look closely, you can see that the top is more brown blue than the bottom. And that's because that's close to the active volcanic crater. Um, the heat from the active volcano melts the ice. The dry valleys, meanwhile, are kept free by are kept free by wind. So in this map, you can see that there's a number of volcanic locations in East Antarctica um, near Ross Island, including Mount Erebus. And then there's a few, um, and then there's a few on the peninsula. And then there's also a hot spring. There's also some hot springs in the Brock Ness Peninsula, but not many, not many ice-free parts at all. The dry valleys are kept ice-free simply by the horrible pressure winds. And I say horrible just because it's a near constant thing to deal with. You are basically living in a wind tunnel. And the wind that's already strong gets made stronger when channeled into that tunnel and blows away any ice before it can really accumulate. It also helps that the, um, the uplift, that ge geologic forces have caused uplift of the surrounding mountains. And those play a role in blocking some of the ice that is flowing in glaciers and approaching the edge of the continent, it stops those glaciers from flowing into the valleys. Um, it is a very dry place. They are as dry as the Atacama Desert. A study in 2009 cited some areas as having less than one millimeter per year of average rainfall. Um, this area is very heavily protected um, in part because there are some really interesting communities of extremophile organisms or organisms that live in environments that we consider uninhabitable. Antarctica is surrounded by the Southern Ocean, which is a term that gets used in the context of Antarctica to refer to the area dominated by the circumpolar current. You might not always see the Southern Ocean listed alongside Pacific, Indian, Atlantic, and Arctic when people talk about the world's oceans because it's kind of a convergence of all of those except for the Arctic Ocean. But it's still distinct enough that we use it as a distinct term in polar science classes. And then you have various seas that are areas trapped between parts of Antarctica, like the Weddell Sea between part of East Antarctica and the peninsula, the Ross Sea between West Antarctica and um, Victoria Land, and then the Bellingshausen Sea, which is a wider sea between the peninsula and the main bulb of West Antarctica. Um, and in these seas, they are completely frozen. They, these seas, you'll notice, have these gray areas that represent the ice shelves, the extensions of the glaciers that don't really melt 
in the summer, although they are starting to break down a little bit more with global warming. You also have sea ice and that sea ice forms in the winter and then melts in the summer and we'll talk later actually how that cycle of melting and um, returning sea ice affects ecology, how many Antarctic organisms are kind of dependent on the presence of sea ice. In the summer, we use icebreaker ships to get through the ice shelves and allow um, supplies to access um, McMurdo base to take and then take human waste and garbage away from Antarctica because we don't, we don't, we don't leave any trash in Antarctica um, because it will stay there. It is very cold and dry and it will not decay. Um, also, the samples that I took in Antarctica that I talked about during lecture, lecture two returned to the United States on one of these icebreaker ships. Um, icebreakers are designed, they have a strengthened hull and they have a shape that clears the ice to the sides and they have really strong engines that have the power to go through them, uh, go through the ice. They are still very hard to handle though. So people who drive icebreaker, icebreaker ships need to be trained specially. Um, we also have subglacial lakes. We have a network of um, we have a network of portions of liquid water in lakes and rivers under the glaciers, and they exist because, in part, because of heat from the earth, but also because when the pressure rises, it becomes easier to melt water. At higher pressures, water can exist at a liquid at a lower temperature. So this means that under the extremely high pressure from the weight of the ice sheet, you can have small portions of liquid water, and they've identified a good number of these subglacial lakes, at least 140 or so now. The largest is about 14,000 kilometers or Lake Vostok, which is, um, which is, which is quite big. And it also um, is believed to have, and some of these subglacial lakes are hypothesized to have interesting microbe communities and people are interested in studying them to make possible parallels with say, does microscopic life live in the sea under Europa, which is one of Jupiter's moons that has an ice surface with liquid water underneath it. However, people are concerned, rightfully so, with causing contamination and possibly wiping out any organisms that live there. So um, it's they're hard to access, almost impossible because of this, because of the thickness of the ice. And we have to be very careful if we even consider going down there, just because we don't want to destroy the life that exists there. Now the Transantarctic Mountains are the main important mountain range in Antarctica. They were actually formed as something called a rift shoulder when the earth gets pushed apart and stuff gets shoved up on either side. And we'll talk about that again when we talk about plate boundaries. So the Transantarctic Mountains form one rift shoulder and they separate West and East Antarctica. It's kind of like the basin and range topography you get in the Western US actually in Utah and Nevada. You have a valley and then you have mountains shoved up on either side. Um, and they are the most prominent mount range of mountains on the continent. The dry valleys are within the Transantarctic Mountains. Um, you can see them. You can see that there's a lot more brown in this area, and that's from the trans. And that's that's the dry valleys within the Transantarctic Mountains. You also have a range of mountains in the peninsula, and the peninsula also has a lot of compared to the rest of Antarctica, a lot of ice-free areas, um, and it's where actually a lot of dinosaur fossils have been found compared to the rest of Antarctica because there is much more exposed rock. Um, and it's also where the only two flowering plants native to Antarctica occur. I saw moss and lichen when I was in Antarctica, but I didn't see any grass or any pearl wort. And the Antarctic hair grass and the Antarctic pearl wort are the two flowering plants native to Antarctica. Um, they live on the peninsula and on some of the surrounding islands, and their ranges are presently expanding because the peninsula is warming very quickly. Um, that is because it's surrounded by the ocean and also because it's farther north. Um, you'll actually notice that um, the peninsula is not actually completely south of the Antarctic Circle. And the Antarctic Circle has to do with the 24 hour daylight. The Antarctic Circle is defined as um, the latitude south of which you will experience 24 hours of complete daylight at least once a year, as well as 24 hours of complete darkness at least once a year. So you'll notice that there's some fringes in East Antarctica as well as part of the peninsula that are not actually part of the Antarctic Circle. And the Antarctic Circle actually changes over geologic time because it relates to the tilt of Earth's axis. And one thing I'll talk about later is how the tilt of Earth's axis has actually been more or less over different points in geologic time. So not all of Antarctica is actually south of the circle and at different points in geologic time, more or less of Antarctica has been has been south of the circle. Now, the actual 
feature that really defines Antarctica is what is known as the Antarctic Convergence or the Antarctic Polar Front. And a front is where two distinct masses of water meet. So water flowing northward from Antarctica meets warmer subantarctic waters and that water, the cold water coming from Antarctica sinks because cold water is more dense. And this convergence exists all around Antarctica. It's this blue line show here. And you'll notice that it includes all of Antarctica as well as a number of other islands. And this convergence is, and at this convergence, the temperature really rapidly drops as you're going from north to south. There is not an equivalent in the northern hemisphere because North America and Eurasia are so close to the North Pole, and there isn't really the space for this to form, nor is there a current going all the way around the continent, or excuse me, all around the Arctic. So in summary, the Antarctic Circle is often used to define Antarctica, but the convergence or the place or the, the place the front where the two water masses meet is probably a more accurate boundary. And it's a good it's a good way to think about the separation between Antarctica and the rest of the world on a climate basis. The second half of this lecture will be much shorter because there's a bit less to say about the human geography. So I'll be back for a short video, shorter video after this, and look forward to that.